The NRL's first trip to Las Vegas is in the books, and while it wasn't a jackpot, overall I do think it was very much a net positive for Rugby League. A winning hand at blackjack, if you will. A nice advertisement for the game, for the league, for NRL, and a chance for Australia to take over Sin City. The NRL in Vegas was a success, I'll give it that, although I don't think it was this groundbreaking occasion some want to make it out to be. And if the sport plans on making big roads in America and globally, well, it needs to fix a huge problem that looks set to hamstring growth. I'm Cheyenne Hollis. This is the Touchback and Viva NRL Vegas. Let's start by addressing the elephant in the room attendance. The NRL announced that more than 40,000 people were at Allegiant Stadium. But when you watch the games on television, it looked quite less than that. I would put it somewhere between 25 and 35,000. Now you do hear some folks saying, oh, there should have been more people, there should have been a sellout, this, that, and the other. Honestly, I don't think attendance was that bad. It was probably no more different than you'd see at a UNLV game. In fact, it was probably better than a couple of UNLV games this season. Yet those empty seats will be a huge detraction for some. To me, I don't see the attendance being a good or bad thing either way. It was probably close to what I had expected going in. Besides, UNLV doesn't sell out Allegiant Stadium and no one is clamoring for them to go back to Sam Boyd, not that they could anyway. Also, Sam Boyd was terrible. It's possible attendance for the NRL in Vegas could have been a bit higher had there not been weather-related reasons for people opting not to turn out. You know, huge windstorms and traffic incidents, all of that stuff made it a little difficult than it should have been for locals in particular to get to the game. That being said, Anything, any sort of decent attendance was good for the NRL considering it has next to no presence in the United States. I mean, yeah, there's like a game on Fox Sports Weekly and maybe another one on Fox Sports Plus, but it's not like we're talking about the EPL or La Liga teams or European Soccer, Champions League, any of that. Compared to that, the NRL is pretty much unknown. This isn't to say that there aren't fans stateside and in Canada and in North America, but it's really, truly just sort of off the radar. That's a shame, but it's also the way it is. You know, as someone who is a big NRL guy, I wish it did have more popularity, and I hope it does grow. But the truth of the matter is, getting more than five or 10,000 people in Las Vegas, in America, to see the sport, I think is worthy of adulation and respect. The other downside of everything, at least if you were in the States, was Fox Sports. Just once again, fumbling their timing in terms of win of events in. And that saw the Sea Eagles Rabbitohs game bump to Fox Sports 2 for that opening 10, 15 minutes or so. Fox Sports 2 is the sports television graveyard. It is where events go to die. It would have been one thing if Fox Sports 1 was showing an important game or something that matters, but... Xavier Georgetown, these are two college basketball teams not going anywhere and not in a hurry to do so. These aren't NCAA tournament teams, barring a historic conference tournament run. These aren't good teams. This is a game that had almost next to no stakes. Why that got priority over this event and over this sport that your brand is trying to promote and make a bigger thing just I found to be absolutely ridiculous. Bump the college basketball game to FS2 or what better yet just start it on FS2 because again it's not like a single digit win team and a 500 team are going to draw huge ratings anyway. I just don't get that decision at all and I think it was the wrong call by Fox Sports to move the start of the NRL doubleheader to FS2 in favor of bad college basketball. But what are you going to do? For me personally, though, the biggest concern I had as an American NRL fan was going to be the quality of play. You know, not only is this the season opener for all four teams involved, which can lead to some disjointed, some janky play altogether, but you also had all of these sides undergoing a altered preseason training. There was some worry that this would also impact just how the teams were preparing for not only these games, but the season in general. You've never seen it before, so you didn't really know what to expect with all four of these sides spending like, I think it was like a week in Los Angeles and then moving to Las Vegas. That's kind of a big deal in the grand scheme of things. That, of course, proved not to be a concern at all. Overall, these NRL games had everything you could possibly want from an NRL game. 
Hits, physicality, action, excitement, speed. Well, everything apart from Jason Saab getting caught from behind by Lachlan Ilias, which just, I don't know what the hell happened there. The highlight across the two games, though, had to be Joey Manu throwing out that perfect form Heisman stiff arm and then tossing a behind the back pass that would have made Jason Williams proud. What an epic play. What is just a... I don't have words for it, but yeah, that is what you want to show when you show NRL highlights, and it delivered in Vegas in that regard. Now, it wasn't all perfect. The Broncos started the season looking like they had a championship losing hangover after that pretty bad loss to the Panthers in the grand final. However, even that wasn't enough to detract from the overall product. To me, the calling card here had to have been the intensity. It wasn't necessarily the best NRL games you'll see played, but the intensity was there. The purpose was there. The passion was there. For me, it was far better than a lot of those early NFL games in London, which were just sloppy, messy. The teams just were very disjointed. I mean, come on, Cleo Lemon, anyone? When you look at the broadcast package overall, what I really appreciate is one, the use of the Australian broadcast teams from Fox Sports. They kept it really much like you would expect to get in Australia. That also means the announced teams, both announced teams, they didn't really baby the audience all that much. It was a fairly normally called game. I mean, sure, there were some things they did take a little more time to explain, but it wasn't over the top in my mind. You know, when soccer was starting to grow in the United States in the late 2000s and early 2010s, this was something announcers were extremely guilty of. There were just a lot of people trying to, I guess, soccer explain everything to normal people who may not have known the sport. But the thing was, is that people watching soccer in America were more likely going to be fans. It's not like randos were turning in to watch Champion League's group stage games or EPL contests. So it was just one of those things that was really frustrating as a soccer fan in America. And I think overall, the Fox Sports crews did a very good job in not sort of devolving the broadcast to where it'd be something a normal NRL fan would just want to pull their hair out listening to. They were maybe a bit overindulgent when it came to trying to describe the atmosphere and the crowd and just that they really wanted you to believe it was this cauldron of noise despite the fact that it was about 20,000 more than 20,000 less than a sellout it was good I'll give them that perhaps a little louder than the Super Bowl but it really didn't feel like the grand final atmosphere that you would see in Australia I just felt they, they tried a little too hard to make it seem like it was a bigger deal than what you could see in here on television a final thought on the broadcast package, at least from an American standpoint, it would have been great if someone would have actually bothered to explain to the American audience what completions mean. When I first started following Rugby League, this was something that I just, I couldn't figure it out. I could not process what completions were and what completion percentages were. I always thought it was like a pass. Like if you complete a pass, that was a completion. And then you would see all of these numbers and percentages and they didn't necessarily match up to the completion. So... Next time I think you have an American audience, that should be the one thing you work to describe or maybe provide a little more background on. It took me a while. It took me a few months to finally sort of process everything. Even now, I don't think completion percentage is that big of a deal, despite what many color commentators want to tell you about completion percentages, but I'll leave it at that. So what is next for the National Rugby League, at least as it relates to the American audience or the overseas audience? To me, it's simple. How about they start by fixing the biggest problem, the biggest obstacle that's going to stop Americans and others from watching more NRL games or being a part of just what they want to build? That, of course, being the comically overpriced watch NRL package. Here's the deal. It's a fine app, lots of good content, not worth the 150 US dollars they want to charge. Not for a sport where many folks aren't going to be able to watch it live stateside. It's sheer lunacy to me that the NRL wants so much money for this. At $50, $60 a year season, I kind of get that. Bundling it in with something else, hell yeah, absolutely sign me up for that. But as a standalone subscription, $150 US dollars, get out of here.
Sure, that's not quite NFL Sunday ticket money, but that sure is a hell of a lot of dough for a sport that has a small fraction of the following most American sports have. If you want to get that foot in the door, you got to make it accessible. And right now, the NRL is not accessible stateside. Sorry, having a game a week on Fox Sports doesn't change that. Beyond that, it's also important for the NRL not to lose sight of the Australian fan base. Building up the US market is cool, but going crazy with expansion and playing games overseas is no good. One of the reasons many overseas fans actually do watch the NRL is because it feels distinctly Australian. It's something we aren't getting with our local sports league products. NRL just hits different than US sports for me. Trying to make it more American not only disenfranchises your Australian fan base, but it also turns off fans such as myself who like it because it's different, because it has a distinctly Australian feel to it. All in all, a good introduction for the NRL into America. It's uh, the equivalent to a penalty field goal, I guess. Put points on the boards, but it's definitely not gonna win you the game. Hopefully, it's the start of growth and increased attention for the NRL at the global level, but let's not go crazy with it. No talks of origin games in the US like Los Angeles, no talks of a US-based franchise. Just because this work doesn't mean you need to take it over the top. Unlike most folks who leave Las Vegas, the NRL is returning home a winner, and that means it's important not to do something stupid on the way out of town. Thank you for watching this video. If you'd like to know a little bit more about what NRL teams stole their name from NFL teams, well, check out the video upper right-hand corner of your screen. Till next time, I am Cheyenne Hollis. This is the touchback hashtag, hashtag seven tackle set, I guess. I never know how to end it when I do an NRL video, but hashtag take it out to the 25.